Welcome to the Nutritious and Delicious podcast with me, Bethany. Our mission is to support busy parents all over the world to learn time management while taking care of your nutritional, physical, and mental health. After all, a healthy family starts with a healthy parent. So I'm super excited today. I have Gina and Don with me here. And Donald and Gina are the proud parents of three children. Donald is a speaker. He's an EFT practitioner and behavioral transformation specialist. And Gina is an occupational therapist, writer, homeschooler, and behavior transformation specialist. That is a lot, you guys. So welcome. I'm so excited. (laughs) And you made it to it, so that's good. We're we're excited to be here. Yes. (laughs) That's awesome. So this is a great one today because our viewers are parents and they have actually been asking for parent coaches because they want to know how to get through some tough times at home. Um, with generational trauma. So that's what our topic is about today is generational trauma and how to actually focus on ourselves. So I would love for you guys to actually dive right in and tell us kind of how you got started um, being parent coaches and kind of share your story with us. Sure. Um, Well, (laughs) we have three children. Our kids are now 24, 20 and 13. And when our middle child was about eight. She developed a sudden onset of obsessive compulsive disorder. And what that looked like um, was a big behavior change. She was suddenly anxious and paranoid and worried and demanding that things get clean, things didn't feel right. Um, She was angry and because she was eight, she couldn't vocalize things to us very well. It was just the floor is dirty. It's gotta be cleaned. Everything's gotta be scrubbed. Things gotta be cleaned. And it kind of turned our world a bit upside down, figuring out um, what was going on with her, trying to get the help we needed. And so through the process of getting her the help, going to doctors and specialists and alternative health practitioners, looking at her diet, uh, nutritional supplements, all these different avenues we went to to try to get her the help, we realized, um, you know, other parents are going through this too. And we wanted to help other people dealing with this, giving them resources, um, support, just knowing it can be a struggle. And I'm a healthcare professional, so I had insight into some of this stuff and just knowing how hard it is um, when parents don't have any idea what's going on. And Well, and our, at the time, our, our youngest, we have one now, uh, she's 13. 13. <laughs> yeah. um, she was about one, one and a half, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. and because of the stuff that would happen a lot of times there were battles that went on into the night um, and she was woken up many times with screaming and yelling and breaking and all kinds of stuff Uh, she I guess it's been about what five or six years ago started to develop some of the same kind of symptoms the OCD so we've not only gone through it once we've gone through it twice Twice. and in fact we're still dealing with some of it as we speak now and so we've we've learned a lot off of it um in the hard way i always called it we we've had on the job training basically as parents um and so like gina said we really want felt strong with what we've been able to gather because anybody that's going through this knows you're grabbing at straws kind of thing let's try this this could be right. the one miracle that could do it this could be the one and we've grabbed it so many of those and so and a lot of them worked that there was a lot that worked there were some that didn't and some that worked some you know and th- so they all came, came kind of came together and so that helped us put this together as as kind of a practice for us uh, Gina being an occupational therapist with all the skills that she's learned with that. Yeah, just understanding from a behavior perspective, the child's developmental stage. And one thing that we wanted to do is a lot of times you can take a child to a therapist, you can get mm-hmm. child help, they have a problem. What we realized it was more than just the one person. It, it's a family issue. And yeah. we really see our practice as helping the whole family, you know, the whole family unit, like you're talking about with generational. Yeah trauma and that you got to start with the parents first yeah well, we saw you know at the at the minimum that the other children feel neglected you know that that because you know when you're in that kind of place and especially as as tough as ours was and severe as ours was 
all your attention and your, yeah. your thoughts and everything are going towards that one child with and somewhat and not I don't know if I like the word neglect but but the attention wasn't there for them and so that's just was at the base of what how they were affected mm -hmm. they were also traumatized and you know they're the oldest child used to somehow I think uh, our middle child used to p kind of pick on him and and kind of abuse him in certain ways of just just being angry, angry at, him, at him taking things out on him just you know mm -hmm. emotionally and it put a strain on their relationship so you know and we, we've recently just we talked about the idea we like to tell our story but we won't we don't want to really tell it in a manner that's get pity for us or to right, I get that. Sorry for us. We yeah. want it to be out there to, to let other people know there's hope right. and to inspire that you can get through this, you know, especially with OCD. OCD is probably one of the more manageable dis disorders out there. And to know that there's hope to have a manageable life, it, it doesn't get cured. You know, like our, our middle daughter now is on her own. She's and she's She's one of the most courageous and strongest persons I know. And to know that and to other people to see that can give them some hope. It's definitely an inspiration. Like I, I totally agree with you. I know when we share our stories out there, my story myself too, is we don't want that pity. We want it to be more of an inspiration and to kind of learn from our examples and what we've done. So I love that about you guys, that you're so open and honest about your own family that you know, look, just because we're professionals, like we don't always have it together. Like we, you know, we also go through different things ourselves and that's part of being human. So that's what I love about it. And thank you for sharing that with um, all of us here. What are you seeing today with parents who actually have generational trauma? What are some of the problems at home? Like I obviously we're kind of noticing it starts kind of with the parents, but I know you probably have parents that maybe bring children in saying, they're you know they're doing this they're doing that but not really aware of maybe what they're going through themselves yeah a lot of times when they come to us they've kind of at the end of their rope to yeah. so to speak and they're starting to realize you know their impact they might not realize the extent of it sometimes they're trying to parent differently than their parents did but they don't know what that looks like right. um you know there can be differences in how the mother and father parent um, or each partner and trying to navigate that. Um, there's often a dynamic issue with one of the parents and usually the child who's got issues with anxiety or whatever the issue happens to be. We work with, you know, all kids deal with different amounts of anxiety. And right now after the pandemic and everything and changes in everybody's lifestyle is added to that anxiety, <clears throat> not only for the kids, but for the parents too, having to adjust and change and well I, I think too that a lot of times i know on a, on a father side of it that we can look at it uh you know when a lot of these kids that have a disorder like like ocd or, or adhd mm -hmm. any of these disorders they're extremely intelligent you know yeah. I, our kids to me are, are near genius i and yeah. i don't say that to brag but just to and so what, what happens a lot of times, and I, I think it's a little heavier on the, the dad side of it, is they have a hard time understanding that there's a problem. Well, these kids are smart enough. They, sh they should be able to get yeah. over this. They should be able to handle it. They should be able to whatever. And so they block it off as it's not really a problem. Mm -hmm. And and so there's the, then there becomes a conflict between the, the spouse, you know, because we didn't have too much of this, but we had some where, you know, I thought one way and Gina thought another way. And so we had to talk through it and, and we try hers and we try mine and whatever, you know, try to get to a point where it worked. But it's getting past that block that there really is something going on up here and they, there is a real problem. It's not something that just these kids are making up. Uh, and just because they're smart doesn't mean they're going to be able to get through it on their own yeah and parents don't often realize what they're putting into the issue you know they're bringing their own stuff and putting their own right. expectations on their kids and a lot of times without realizing it i mean i know you've worked with adults and kids and kids can get through issues almost more quickly because they don't have as much baggage right as as we do as adults um 
when you get the the parent that says it fi fix my kid you know yeah. not me <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a, and we yeah. have to gently kind of come back and say okay hold on a minute let's let's do you know we always work on the parents first really yeah. and you know i do the work with the conscious part of it getting the the mind clear all that um, but yeah, sometimes it takes a little bit to get the parent to understand how how much their energy, their their being is affecting their kids. Mm -hmm. And I, when I, we get that when we get that cleared, or when, when you help them get to a better place, it actually makes working with the child much easier. I agree. I've seen that quite often, and I think a lot of parents don't realize like what they're bringing in. I think they've also like, I know you talk about the fathers, like the, a lot of the dads probably have that tough approach maybe depending on the, the person. I could imagine that there's that feeling of um, like when, you know, it's something to do with the child. It's usually like, well, mom knows how to deal with it. Like the dad's probably like to suck it up or I, you know, I went through worse as a kid or things like that. Like just to kind <laughs> yeah. of tough it out. It's, mm -hmm. it doesn't, like you said, it's kind of minimized as a problem to start with. And again, like with parents and stuff too, like we definitely kind of minimize like our own baggage, I guess, that we've kind of come out of um, and we bring it in. And like you said, I think you kind of either say like, we avoid being our own parents or we try to sort of mimic them but if we don't want to be like our parents in a sense we don't really have that roadmap either mm -hmm. so we're kind of just blindly going into this i think we all are like blindly going into raising children mm -hmm. and kind of hoping that like they're going to be okay, okay. <laughs> after all and everything right so you know i guess what are some great tools and tips that you can kind of advise to our parents who are bringing their own trauma into the family mix? Like, what do you usually start with talking to the parents about in your practice? I think it's really the conscious part, you know, talking about what's going on for them in, in their own mind and, and those patterns that they are following of the parents, their parents, you know, because we didn't get that book with the um, umbilical cord, that, that yeah. manual <laughs> didn't come out. So we have, we're doing it based on what we've learned from our parents what we hear from peers or friends or, you know, relatives. And we need to look at each one of those things that we're doing, those patterns that we might be doing. And is that really working for you? Is that really helping in this situation? And how do we change that? And you've done works as an EFT practitioner. And so that's kind of where we start. We kind of have a program with parents and part of that are EFT sessions. And you always start with the parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's tapping, it's I'll let you speak on that, releasing the energy of, that you're carrying around with all these issues. Yeah, it, you know, the like I say, the first, I, I start out from, a, let, let's look at how we can turn, be more conscious. And when I say that term, I always like to preface it by kind of explaining it because most people look at consciousness and mindfulness as mm -hmm. kind of a fluff kind of thing. It's, you know, it's kind of out there, like, yeah, whatever that is. But I talk about it as tuning in. We have to tune in to what's going on for us first. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, because we, I think even yesterday we were talking about conscious parenting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's tuning in to what we're doing as a parent. But the first place is tuning into ourselves, becoming aware of what's going on, listening for these messages, the thoughts. And that's what we work through is to, is to change the perspective around how we're thinking so that it's, it's we get clarity of mind that way we can think better we can do better as a parent but do better as a person uh, so that's our first first place and one of the first things i talk to parents about because a lot of times when parents sit down in front of me they are the one of the first things they they worry about is i'm screwing my kid up I, all that's the mistakes normal. i've made all the stupid things i've done or whatever it is yeah. And I, I really want them to understand that these mistakes they make, these screw ups they do or whatever they're doing are really lessons for the, the kids. They're, they're more than likely, unless unless they're not doing anything about the problem. Right. But if they've made it through the mistake, if they've resolved the issue, if they're working on themselves, then they're 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 a beautiful example to their kids about how they can make it through a mistake, how they can make it through and become better person. 
because somewhere down the road, the parents aren't going to be around and they're going to have to make those decisions for themselves. And if they've had the example, you know, dad, dad really screwed up that one time, but he made it through it. So yeah, this is going to be difficult, but I can make it through it because of that. Right. So it's teaching sense, by but... example, it sounds yes, like. Yeah. Yeah. Kids learn through watching us. And I know people have talked about, you know, if you fight with your spouse, partner, um, you know, to not do it in front of the kids. Well, the problem is you disappear and then maybe things get resolved and the kids don't no see idea. that. Right. And yeah. Depending on the age of the kids, it's helpful for them to see the process of negotiating and and working through that argument. Um, knowing you're human you know yeah too. i mean not not do you want you don't want abusive stuff you know yeah. hitting or this that kind of thing but but to have an argument or disagreement we've we've had <laughs> a few um but to see that you make it through it you know anxieties like that i talk about that with anxiety you know when we get amped up into anxiety the mind goes into a place of oh my god this is going to go on forever right and we have to show the mind that there's a downside there's another side to it, that we will come out of it and the more we can do that and that's what we work on the more we can do that that shrinks that place where they go up the mind goes up into it and goes um, you know now and it so i i think it happens that, that that's both for, for the examples and and dealing with anxiety we have to show the results or the, the re resolution to it I love cat that. Was. Sorry, got... our cat wants to be part of the interview. Oh, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Usually I have children coming on and stuff from other people, but yeah, cats are great. <laughs> um, it sounds it sounds great. It sounds like you kind of hook the parents first in terms of like dealing with telling them it's going to be okay and you're not screwing your kids up. So I think that's a typical notion for a lot of parents, even like raising a baby. I think a lot of new moms even say that like I they feel like they're constantly I, I felt like that definitely with my first um I had no idea I felt like I was failing all the time and how was I supposed to sort of know right out the gate what to do and like you said Dawn I think it's very much what you've talked about like you know if we've had parents or caregivers in our life that maybe fight but we don't see sort of the resolution or how like how to do that we go into like our adult relationships not really knowing what we're supposed to do we're supposed to just sort of like come back together and like everything's all peachy and all that but again yeah i i understand what you're saying like it's involving the kids in some sort of way of like resolution and you know talking about like we all you know adults aren't perfect either and i do actually bring this up to my boys and say that to them like i say like adults aren't perfect and you know, we have to work on ourselves as well. And because I think children, especially at younger ages, also see parents or adults per se as like superhuman and, you know, mm -hmm. they never get anything wrong and everything they say right. is right. And then you get to like an adult and you're like, wait a minute, I listen to all these people and <laughs> why did I take all this advice, you know? So we've kind of grown up surrounded by um, what we see as the truth, I guess. But as an adult, we're almost like backpedaling and relearning mm -hmm. um, kind of who we want to be and, and what kind of parent we want to become and how open do we want to be with our kids about, you know, fights or anxiety or depression. And like, even in the last few years for myself, like I've definitely, I think, opened up more to my boys about anxiety and depression and what it all means because of just the situation in my life with with them and also for them as well because they have experienced that themselves um obviously having lost a parent so for them like i've seen sort of the opposite like i see more i think hoarding mentality mm -hmm. um and don i don't know if this is something that you see in children as well with anxiety but um, where maybe they hold on to things longer mm -hmm. than kind of expected um, mm -hmm. versus what you said with your your daughter about the cleaning obsession, right? So there's obviously lots of different parallels and stuff around that. How can parents help themselves first with what they have experienced so we're not really passing on this kind of generational trauma that you guys kind of see? I mean, the first step is recognizing you know their own issues and yeah. kind of reflecting and there's so many different ways to do that we did a whole section on self-care with our podcasts you know whether it's some kind of mindfulness practice meditation exercise 
a um, hobby, you know, a hobby, um, That's a good idea. journaling. I'm a big fan of journaling and writing, having that little bit of time for yourself in some fashion. Maybe you enjoy cooking or gardening or finding that, that, um, that nurtures you and fills you. Cause if you're depleted all the time, you can't yeah. give anything right to your kids. Yeah. That's right. something that we, a lot of, I get a lot of what I call pleasers and givers that mm -hmm. come into, into my mm -hmm. practice. And, um, it, it's really tough because they, they haven't learned the balance. They, they, right. They've actually a lot of times have developed their whole life based on others' expectations. And then they, they get lost in how who they really are mm -hmm. because they've all they've only built their life on their parents or the other people in their lives. Uh, and so we have to come to a place of they have to understand a, a giver runs out, burns right. out. And and I what I try to tell them is that, you know, I love the fact that you love to give and help others. That's, that's wonderful. But you, at a certain point, you're going to be at a place where you're not going to be able to do that. Right. Either you're not here, you know, because you've made yourself so sick that you're gone. Right. Or, or you're just sick and you can't do it. And so your giver thing runs out at a certain point. So there has to be a learned balance of give and receive, give and receive. You know, you have to refuel yourself. Um, and it, that what, what happens a lot of times with those is they, they train everybody around them, all their mm -hmm. so-called support that they might try to get not to give them support, not to give mm -hmm. them help. Right. And so they have to retrain them and they have to learn to ask for what they want. Um, it, and it's not easy. It's not an easy no. task. They're, they're not used to that, but it, it's part of it. The other thing we, we do is communication. We have found, I know with, with my, my first daughter with the OCD, she, she seemed to pick on me a lot, uh, too, and would come at me with, ah, just screaming, yelling, you know, angry, very angry and, and mm -hmm. just, um, and I would match her, you know, right back. Yeah. And but we would end up, I always, always say, climbing the, the walls together to anxiety. And I had to learn, and, and Gina was very helpful in me learning this, that we had to do it differently. We had to communicate and handle this differently. You no, know, no matter what was going on with her, we still had to treat her with respect. That she mm -hmm. was a person and these behaviors were not just behaviors to mess with us and push our buttons there was underlying things going on and as young as she was she didn't fully understand what was going on and so approaching it differently and that's the big component you know with all the different help we got from different practitioners we kind of felt like there was a piece missing mm -hmm. that we weren't finding out there and all the help and it was that communication piece and the importance of really listening no matter where your child's at they need to be heard and sometimes mm -hmm. that's a huge thing for any kids in typical situations. Sometimes it's a matter of just being quiet and yeah. giving them that chance to speak, tuning into them, putting down what you're doing, putting your phone down and looking at them, recognizing them. The simple way to really listen is responding with short one word um, answers, answers kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, wow. And in and order to feel shut up, <laughs> feel heard, because if they can feel heard, then you're not in that constant battle with them. And it makes your life easier in the long run, too. Well, Gina really helped me and, and she would she reminded me, she said, you know, just remember who's inside that OCD bully. Yeah. That's your daughter, your loving daughter. And that really helped change my thoughts. I would approach it remembering this is this is not my daughter coming at me. This is OCD really coming at me. Right. And I, I actually, when I work with people now, I, I had developed this whole idea around the compassionate coach. And that's about how you can be compassionate, but firm. We had to be firm with what we were doing, right. but, but compassionate at the same time. And it made a, made a big difference how we communicated, how we handled it. 
it, it brought that stuff down. You know, as long as I stayed calm or we stayed calm, this could rise up. Her her side would rise up some, but not to the extent it would before. And usually it would just kind of go mm -hmm. down. And it made a huge, huge difference in how and in, in helping to change things. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Like I definitely can see that in a lot of different relationships um, with partners, with kids, with boundaries of other family members. Um, so much good stuff was said. Like I know you talked first about like the bucket situation of like filling up your own bucket. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, if you keep giving to other people, you're never going to have anything for yourself. So it's like giving from a bucket that's basically got holes in it and mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we talked about with my kids like i definitely said that even from an early age my youngest i think he was like three at the time and he would say like my my bucket's not filled and that was a, he, he's so emotionally intelligent this kid like i don't get it <laughs> but he would come home and he'd like if someone hurt his feelings or was taking from his bucket he'd let you know and he'd tell you like my bucket's empty <laughs> but we had to sort of learn they're very like my boys are very opposite um we had to sort of learn one had to be more of a giver and the other one had to kind of pull back on giving because again like that relationship like you said don about somebody always giving you will train that person to keep you know expecting um mm -hmm. everyone to sort of do the same thing so i kind of saw that already young in my boys because mm -hmm. i did it myself like i was a giver um, pleaser, all that. And I think we don't really realize it as we go through this thing called life. And I thought I was just being generous and, you know, all of this of my time. And my, but I think what we realize is when our energy is drained and we have nothing left, um, for me, it became, I think my hitting point on, on that aspect was, um, when I did become a widow and a single mom basically overnight and it was like all of a sudden I didn't have that capacity for anybody else around me anymore um, and I had to sort of start concentrating on myself and my own growth and physically like what I needed and I think I had to sort of reteach um, people around me I guess like what I needed in my life and it doesn't go down well when you're an adult because all of a sudden you start pulling back on these things and people don't like that right mm -hmm. so it's it's tough it's not an easy process and it doesn't happen overnight but I think it's learning to have strong boundaries um for mm -hmm. what you you need in your life like just even typical stuff because if you can't keep giving um all the time without getting anything back and the other thing i was thinking about that is um in terms of people not receiving don do you feel that this is where people are because they're they don't want to be vulnerable like is that where you see people are more afraid like what's your thoughts on that well um I think it's probably, again, it goes back to how their parents, what, what their parents did, mm -hmm. you know. You um, need to be strong for the kids. You need to. Um... Well, you know, I, I <laughs> this kind of goes a little deep, but I talk about the sponge years. Sponge years. It's the, those first, well, you know, the, I, I guess in the, in the, in the world out there that, that's considered from like birth to about five or eight years old that those sponge what they call i call it sponges i think that's not my term i didn't make it up um where we're absorbing our environment we're absorbing from what the parents say i think it goes to about 27 you know <laughs> wow because we know well we know that the brain doesn't fully develop till then and i think it just changes in in its form you know initially those first i'd say five to eight years we're taking things in from our environment without filtration, without uh, any kind of way of handling it or knowing how to handle it. So we really are taking things in verbatim. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's whatever the parents are telling us, you know what, I, what I use, the parents may be, we see that as being the right stuff, no matter what it is. Even if mm -hmm. I've seen this with abused people, uh, kids that have been abused, um, that whatever they're telling me, it must be the right thing. Right. And if it doesn't feel right, then it, we don't put it on the parents, we put it on ourselves. Right, yeah. the coping strategy. It must be my fault that my parents got divorced. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and I must have been a really bad kid for my dad to hit me like that. 
to hurt me yeah. like I, 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 it didn't feel good, but it, it's not their fault. It's mine. It, right. Because we want our parents to be everything. And, yeah. you know, we, they're, they're our center of our universe and that we, um, they can do no wrong. Right. So even yeah. if they're abusive or not doing things in a healthy way, the kids don't see that. They, yeah. And so they take that on. That becomes foundational then. That's, I call it the bricks of their foundation. And so when I'm when I'm working with them, I'm I'm saying, okay, we're going to take out each one of those bricks one at a time, mm -hmm. and look at that message, whatever it was, and does that fit you now? Does that work for you now? And if it doesn't, we need to change the perspective around it. We need to put a new brick in there, or right. get rid of that brick. And Bethany, you touched on something very big about boundaries. Yeah. And that's something you know, our parenting is not only influenced by our own past, but the people around us in our life. If we have extended family nearby, or even if yeah. they're not, you know, our parents come to visit, our in-laws, and that can be a difficult thing, setting boundaries with other people. And look, this is how I'm raising my kids. I appreciate what you're doing, you know, I, but I need you to be respectful of the way I'm doing things. And that can be really difficult, especially to speak up to your own parents as an adult. Well, and, and the givers, what I think what happens with them, like I, I actually just had a client I'm working with right now that the parents were got divorced mm -hmm. and it wasn't the greatest situation. They weren't too bad, though. It wasn't terrible the way the parents handled it. But the, the child took on responsibility mm -hmm. to take care of the uh, guard, the others from the pain, guard right. the others from the hurt, guard them from whatever, the, if there was abuse or whatever. And so they take it on. That's where the giver, I think, has started to be created right there. Is because I gotta, I gotta take care of them, not me, them right now. They're more important. The parents, kind of, in a, in their way, not necessarily even saying it, but just have put that kind of responsibility on top of them. And so, like I say, I, I think all that stuff that happens in the sponge years, and, and then what happens as you get older in the teen years, that the influences become the peers. Right. And you get better at filtering it. You get better at having some ways of handling it, but not all, you know, and we don't get that till we're, the brain's fully developed. So we're still getting influence. We're still taking in and still blaming ourselves a lot of times for some of the stuff that goes on. Definitely. That's super interesting. Like even before I know you mentioned kind of about like when you're matching somebody like in a, in a state of anxiety or anger, like that's what, like you kind of get out what you grew or you're giving right and mm -hmm. i think a lot with a lot of people who feel that they're givers they're going to get that in return and they're very obviously um you know heartbroken when people don't do that for them and they're right. always kind of giving and stuff as well but same with that anxiety and anger and matching somebody it's almost like like as the parent you definitely need to sort of step back and look at yourself and say okay like I'm the parent in this situation and like you what you said about with your daughter is looking at sort of it separated um as a condition or a disease or something that's maybe going on and it's outside of that that person um you know when there's generational trauma even in other adults and things like that it's sometimes you know like adults also act out in a way of like being like a child because they're sort of stuck in that maybe year or headspace of when they were a child and feeling trapped or whatever it was mm -hmm. that they maybe went through and it's kind of brought into like this um daily um like incidents or whatever of something that's triggered triggered yes. in them and mm -hmm. unfortunately because as a family you know it's triggered by it could be triggered by children it could be triggered by a partner and like it could be triggered by the whole family dynamic or outside like you know parents and stuff like that um ourselves so i think it's great that you know bringing that consciousness to seeing it first like you kind of look at it like maybe like a movie playing in front of you like this is maybe what's happening because i think a lot of people what happens is they live it and they they feel like it won't ever go away like you said and that's what builds the anxiety is that this will never stop how i mm -hmm. feel will never stop um but i think when you sort of step out of it and see it and you start to see like you know maybe people come in saying like they want this person to change or the child or the partner or something like that but not also seeing like how are you contributing to that as well yourself and kind of like what's the dynamic going on mm -hmm. so what are some tools that you guys can actually advise to parents to help them kind of cut that chain 
of the generational trauma with their own family. <laughs> I mean, there's uh, the, the EFT uh, uh, work that I do, but I mean, the EFT is a is something that once I teach somebody, they they use it for themselves. It's um, mm -hmm. I don't I always try to figure out how to how to say that right. But it's kind of a self practicing yeah, process. Yeah, you need a tool use. that you can use so that you need to first recognize, okay, my kid's triggering me mm. when she acts like this. It's reminding me of how my sister treated me, or it's reminding me of other things, or my partner's reminding me of my my mother. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, recognizing those things and having a tool to use, and that's EFT is great because I. People say, take a deep breath or step away. It can be hard to just remove yourself in the situation. Whereas with tapping, you can be in the middle of it. Like, I'm so angry. I can't believe this <laughs> is happening. Yeah. And you can, yeah. you can start with that high emotion of where you're at. And just the simple process of tapping on these meridians is going to help calm your system. Well, yeah, you know, I, I, I've been doing talks on mindfulness and consciousness and really mindset and, um, what I get a kick out of, you know, I think the reason that people have a tough time with mindfulness or consciousness is that the gurus out there that, that talk about it, you know, one of the first steps they tell you to do, just clear your mind, you know, and like, but you're not in that state, <laughs> how, you know, when you're not there, yeah. that's a tough place to try to get to. I mean, I, I think it's possible, but it's a very tough place. So the first place you have to go is like you, you were saying being aware of what's going on for you what are the messages what are the thoughts what is the pattern that you set up that generational tra trauma that you've gotten being aware of it so that you can start changing that first and that when we're working with the eft we're changing the negative first right because the negative will just chew up a positive if, if you're trying to do all the affirmations i'm such a great person but their mind is going what are you talking yeah. about? You, you don't know. You're not smart. You, all those negative messages. So you got to get past those. And so when I talk about mindfulness, I, I talk about we got to get to the awareness first and realize what's going on. And then we can start doing other things. You know, then we can start changing it. So it, it, it the mindfulness is a, is a tool, but it, it has to be done in a way that, that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing we did, Don and I went to counseling when we were first dating before we even had a first fight. <laughs> and um, you invited me to go because you were tired of having relationships that failed. And um, so we learned some really great skills um, yeah. in mirroring, listening to each other. Yeah. And like one thing we learned is if, if someone needs to be a sounding board, letting them know. And we used to say, you know, I'm going to put my armor on. I'm not going to take anything you say personally. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to be, a, I'm just going to let, you know, let you get this stuff out. Right. And it's, it's hard to do, but having those foundational skills to use with each other is powerful. And when we do communication skills workshops, you know, we're working with the parents and they get to practice these skills. And we suggest that, you know, practice this with each other in order to be more effective communicator with your children. You need to grow these skills for yourself and your own relationships with your coworkers, you know, family and friends. Well, what people don't <laughs> understand, they don't realize is uh, communication not only affects the way you speak or talk to someone, it affects behavior, it affects anxiety, you know, we, one of the catchphrases we always use is behavior is a foreign language because behavior is just a form of communication of a deeper underlying problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that as parents that we don't, it, it isn't about changing the behavior. It's looking at what's going on underneath it, that, mm -hmm. that you have to get to that will change the behavior. So what, what's your guys' thoughts on like kind of like a family sort of meeting or again, like it sounds like you guys have done a lot, a lot of work even before sort of having your first fight and understanding that like <laughs> it's great because I think you guys almost have more of the tools and understanding that it, the fights happen. And I think um, it's when I think people go into it thinking like relationships don't need to have fights or if we're fighting, there's something wrong or <laughs> if I'm arguing with my kids, there's something like wrong um what about having those 
times where you know you sit your family down and say hey everybody can have a chance to talk and again like i think with the having the armor on you know how can we sort of do that with it being neutral and no one feels attacked or anything like that like is that something that you would consider like a healthy thing to do yeah and there's yeah. different ways of doing that um, talk about Ray. <laughs> yeah, we we worked with this gentleman, Ray Gray. He's awesome. And he, he does the thing, was it once a week at dinner time? And he say, okay, this is your chance to evaluate me. <laughs> you know, and be, you can use colorful language yeah. and just be real open. I want to know what's going on. Right. And even if it's only for a short period of time of, of having that space. Um, we, we don't necessarily, we've tried that a couple times. Our kids, meeting, are, but... our kids are really spread out in age. There's an 11 year gap between the yeah. oldest and the youngest. And we used to try having family meetings and <laughs> our old, our oldest and our middle child just were like oil and water and just very different in how they process things. And so for us, we found it tricky. I love that idea of a family meeting, yeah. but it, it tended to become a, this is, this problem is happening with this kid. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. And I, so what we had to do was kind of have individual little meetings and um well i sat down with like i said the the middle child the, who had the ocd and, and the, the older child who was more kind of um, on the spectrum of like uh well anyway he, he was very detailed kind of person and the two of them like she said was oil and water so mm -hmm. one day because they they get into some some arguments not nothing too bad, but arguments. And finally one day I just, I sat them both down and I said, okay, I, I'm going to ask both of you to, to tell the other one what it's like when this happens. And so I said, and I told one, I said, now you got to be quiet and just listen and you tell it. And that one would tell the, the what, what it felt like when he did this or that or the other. And then vice versa, I did the opposite. And it really kind of changed things for them. They, they handled things differently. I, my The oldest got to realize what he was saying or doing and how it was affecting him. Mm -hmm. So he could kind of change it. He still has a few things with it, but well, they get along. Yeah, as adults now, they get along. But it did make a big difference in their relationship because, you know, our middle child had gone through this really difficult period with her anxiety and the OCD, and it made um challenge for their relationship. So this was kind of a little bit years later to kind of heal and mend that. And um, there's an assessment I do. It's the Murphy Meyer personality type indicator. It's very similar to the Myers-Briggs personality oh, inventory, but it is normed for school age children. Hmm. And understanding how you process information, how you interact with others can be so helpful. And um, I remember telling, this was even earlier, that uh, my son, you know, your sister processes things through her feelings. That's how hmm. she takes in things. And he looked at me and goes, oh, that would be awful. <laughs> and just having that understanding, and I've done it with both my youngest two and helping to understand her friends and other kids, mm. you know, for them, when they go into a group setting, they just want to talk to everybody they can, you know, they're an extrovert and they're mm. seeking out, out people. Whereas you kind of want to stick with one person and helping them to understand that different people do things differently, take in information differently and process things differently to just understand those differences in people. And so it can be helpful within a family to uh, talk about those things, That's even as thing. parents. We have to realize we all come in individually different, right? Mm -hmm. And I love that you do that, um, Gina, like, especially with your kids. I actually, um, just listening to you guys talk about kind of doing the individual thing too. Um, and like, this is what I do with my boys as well, is that when they hurt each other's feelings, I did exactly what you've done too, is that I've said like, hey, this like, talk about how it's made you feel. And, you know, I think that's really helped as well is that when they've had those conversations with each other, it's opened up their eyes to realize I really hurt my brother, whether it was the words they used or, you know, they wrestle around and hurt each other. And, you know, sometimes they do it deliberately, right? So it's, <laughs> it's interesting, like that was something that came up and it, it triggered me because you know, like to me, like, I don't like to see other people's feelings hurt or anything like that. And I'm very much an advocate for other people. So of course, like mom jumps in and I want to fix it right away. But I know <laughs> right. deep down, I'm like, okay, these guys are the ones who need to like work it out together because there's mm -hmm. no point me um, disciplining either one of them in terms of because it just doesn't mean anything to them. 
right? So I thought, you know, the best way to do it is to turn each other towards each other and say like, hey, what can you do to make the other person feel better now? Now that you've like hurt their feelings and they've explained to you, like you hurt my feelings, what you said or how you scratched me or whatever it was that they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, I kind of self high fived myself because I was like, you know, <laughs> as much <laughs> as I wanted to intervene and do that again, we're not helping them. We're not helping them understand and resolve. So like, that's great to hear. And I think the individual, the individual one, I think I'm going to keep practicing that one too, is having that conversation and that open dialogue. Mm -hmm. of, I like that sort of assessment thing. You got to have a bit of a thick skin, I guess, <laughs> for, for the verdict, I guess. But if, you know, it's interesting listening to what they have to say, even at a young age, I think it's mm -hmm. kids are very wise. And sometimes I think they are our teachers as much as we are teaching them. Exactly. That's and an, I was going to say what you're talking about, you know, is teaching problem solving skills. When we step in, and kids are fighting and you mm -hmm. intervene and you say you go to your room or, you know, you take away something from them. You know, that's not teaching them to figure out the problem. Right. And there's a whole component of our class that's about facilitating problem solving. And it's a skill we need to learn. It's a skill we need throughout our life. And so when there is an issue, whether it's between you and your child or siblings sitting down with them and saying, okay, this is the problem. You know, what's the problem for you as a parent, you can kind of be the negotiator. Okay. Now let's let you speak and reminding them, or this is their time to speak. I'm like, okay, what can, what can you guys do to resolve this and giving them that opportunity mm -hmm. to come up with ideas because they're going to be much more invested in it if they come up with the idea. And then if you're in there telling them what they need to do. Um, right. Well, and it kind of comes up with that same idea we talked about earlier, later on in life, mm -hmm. when you're not there, they've got to be able to solve that problem. And if you haven't given them the skills, right. You know, I, I we, we, we know some uh, different people. I, I've run into people before that they, they do everything for their kids throughout their life. And then at 18, they go, well, you're 18 now. Bye. Time to go, you know, yeah. and then the kids are lost. You know, they don't yeah. know what to do. So yeah, this problem solving and teaching them how to, how to deal with things is very important. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, if your kids are well behaved and they do what they're told, what happens when you're not there or a teacher's not there telling them what to do? They're going to do what other people tell them, whether it's right. their peers and it might not be the best influence. And so it's OK to have a little conflict, a little, you know, we decide to do things differently with our kids. And my mother used to say to me, when you live in your own house, you can make the own rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd look at Don and go, wait a minute, we're the parents now. And we've got these kids who talk back to us, and, you know, speak their <laughs> minds. But I you know, it's an important skill. They need to be able to speak up for themselves. They need to be able to yeah. advocate for themselves. And so it, it can be challenging in the moment and when they're young, yet um, you see the benefits of, you know, when they're adults and two of our children are adults now. So, and, and how that helps them in their life to be able to advocate for themselves. Yeah, just, and, just rubs against us though sometimes. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, we weren't raised like that. You yeah, know, right, you right. darn kids nowadays, you know. <laughs> But that's giving a healthy debate. And I think that's what we kind of talked about is that I think having, it sounds like a more open dialogue as a family that if, you know, something's not feeling right, it's something where somebody can actually speak up and say something. And it's not just mm -hmm. do as I say, because I think a lot of parents have had that um, notion of do as I say. And like you said, Gina, about like, this is my house, my rules, my way. And again, you know, to a point where kids don't really know like who they are or what to do when they leave because they've kind of just felt like they're under someone else's thumb I guess um mm -hmm. and now they're looking for somebody else to sort of tell them what to do and that brings in relationships like that right so you know it's great there's so much so much to talk about here but I appreciate you guys <laughs> coming on and really giving us a lot of your tidbits and stories and everything so Thank you so much for coming on to the Nutritious and Delicious podcast. Where can our viewers actually contact you guys? They can find us at our website, which is focusedhealthyfamily.com. From, uh, from the website, you can get to our podcast. You can learn about our communication skills workshops that we have. They can follow us on Facebook at Focused Healthy Family. I have an Instagram account, Gina at Focused Healthy Family. 
Yeah. And um, we appreciate Bethany you inviting us to be here and being able to talk about this. It's we, we love to talking have. about it. So it, yeah. it, you know, even telling our story again as an inspiration. So uh, thank you. You're welcome. I love it so much. I'm going to put your guys's um, stuff in the notes as well for everybody. So that way they can find you guys. So I appreciate it for coming on. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.